Good afternoon, everyone. Let's talk webinar series in response to COVID-19. Today, we're going to be hearing from our full-time faculty advisor for the Certificate in Management for Information Professionals, Dr. Rajesh Singh, and one of the most recent graduates of the Certificate in Management, an associate professor at St. John's University Libraries, Shilpa Karnik. And they're going to walk us through a brief presentation on the best practices of uh, crisis management and uh, the materials covered in the program of study certificate of management for information professionals uh, in just a moment. So again, take the moment to uh, mute your microphones if you would, and uh, we'll get started momentarily. I'm going to pass the ball, as we say in WebEx, to Dr. Singh, who's going to take over as presenter for the duration of his presentation. And then I, Michael Crossfox, will join you again at the end of uh, his presentation to run through some DLIS housekeeping. So Dr. Singh, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and start your presentation. Thank you, Michael, uh, for introducing me. And let me tell you how we're going to talk about, Michael already introduced about that we are going to talk about crisis management. And I'm just going to provide you, given the context, like we are already experiencing an, a, a global pandemic, and this is, something that doesn't happen on daily basis. So this is the context So our goal is not to talk about this pandemic, but to provide you a context because it has affected well-being of individuals, organization and society as a whole. And in fact, it has crippled many organizations and many organizations are trying to figure out a new way of functioning, new way of doing it. So we just wanted to talk briefly about it. What I mean, there can be similar kind of situation in the future. It may be a different crisis. It may be a hurricane. It may be a tornado. And how we are going to respond to those kinds of crises if that situation happens. And our particular focus would be in the context of libraries and information organization and how we prepare our graduates in this program so that they are ready to prepare uh, for the battle. So, just think about what are the major characteristics of crisis? What it does. You, yeah, share your screen with us, please. Oh, you can see it? Uh, no, we see you. We're seeing your screen. Okay, so I'm seeing major screen. Uh, I'm it is in the screen mode. Okay, so I, do I need to do it again or what? Okay, Let's hold on. Can you see it now? Yes, thank you. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> I was just confused about it. But I was thinking about everybody seeing that uh, uh, screen. So, okay, so when we think about what are the major characteristics of crisis, it just, uh, you know, what it does, it, it, it affects the decision-making capability of uh, organization, decision-making units. And it reduces the time to uh, time to confront the situation, and it surprises and overwhelms the strategic decision making unit in any given organization. So, what happens? Like, what is the process of crisis management? Is the process by which we deal, and uh, you know, the the that are uh, challenges. Um, of a of a crisis in any given situation, and there are generally what literature suggests there are five stages like identifying, detecting the signal, what's happening in the environment, how environment has changed. Just identify like this crisis has affected all organization. It has affected uh, psychologically so many people in in right now regardless of the organization they're working for so identify those kind of situation and how we are going to respond to those situation in the context of our organization for me in particularly in my course when i'm teaching how i'm responding to uh, to, to students needs who are experiencing those challenges and preparing like in every organization when we think about like SWOT analysis, strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. When we're talking about preparing, it's just like kind of capacity assessment. You know, uh, just thinking about what kind of strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats 
there are in our organization and knowing that well would help us prepare for uh, prepare in order to prevent and respond to the crisis and in preventing once you have um idea about strength weaknesses opportunities and threat we can we can take steps to prevent those um, crises we can have those contingency plans in our organization those indicators we can assess that can help us understand what kind of crisis i mean are we facing i mean the crisis can be a two type let me talk uh, tell you one is natural crisis, natural disasters like hurricane or pandemic, global pandemic we are experiencing. It doesn't happen on uh, so frequently, unlike the other kind of crisis that's called a smoldering crisis. And research such as third, fourth crisis are those smoldering crises uh, that happen in organization due to due to poor management of managers and leaders and that could be rumors backstabbing communication pr crisis you just name it so third fourth of crisis happen in organization for which by the way those leaders and managers they are often blamed unlike these natural crises like we are experiencing for which leaders are seldom blamed but it cannot happen like you know for a week or two nobody is going to blame because the situation is new and we have to adapt to those circumstances and respond but what happens after two three weeks even we are not making any progress we are not responding so that's basically it's about preventing knowing those signals and having contingency plan and how we respond respond communication channel and basically everything we do in our organization who who does what and when you know who is communicating and recovering then we after learning what has gone through it like in crisis there is opportunity there are kind of two kinds of mindset like one oh well we haven't done this before how we are going to do we have to find best you know consensus of everybody in any crisis management there's no time for look to find a consensus it is a good approach we can find it we can try to do it we should do it it isn't about making executive decision but there isn't enough time to get everyone on board we have to identify just three to five or just top most priorities that should be done if we do it today we can make our organization perfect because no decision will be perfect there will be mistakes and we should be ready for that so what what is a crisis mindset? You know, when we are talking about crisis mindset, it requires the ability to be battle ready two hours, hours, seven days a week, 365 days throughout the year. So, and at the same time, trying to find solution of the problem. So that means we have to have a list of contingency plans always ready because the first line of defense is not going to work i mean we have to know good leaders always know that you can anticipate the uh, contingency but there's no guarantee those situations will emerge exactly the same way and our response would be the best response so it is important to have a list of contingency plans and rapid response to the uh, changing circumstances so crisis leadership, it's basically the same thing that we talked earlier, signal detection, you know, identifying those indicators, situation when those things are happening because information is changing rapidly. More often than not, information is incomplete. People don't know there's a cognitive overload and it's, it's kind of challenging. I mean, it just seems very easy to tell to build an environment of trust because having an environment of trust that cultivates uh, a kind of healthy relationship in an organization. It is a kind of very basic thing, but it is not easy to have to build an organization of trust. If, if there is a trust, people would be receptive to ideas. Preparation and prevention, reforming the organization here, this is where we need to change the mindset of an organization because what happens in an organization if there are some influential uh, stakeholders, some powerful people whose priorities take precedence over the well-being of the organization, then uh, there's a problem. So we need to think about, about the overall picture of the organization because 
I mean, crisis reflects the competency of an organization, particularly in times of crisis, it is the action of an organization as a whole that reflects the uh, competency, leadership competency of an organization. Containment and damage control, again, the same point that I highlighted before, just to know your vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities of the organization, weaknesses and threats of the organization. If people cannot talk in a transparent manner, then how, how, how progress is going to happen? And business recovery is just learning from mistakes. Again, as we talked before, there are two kinds of mindset. Either we adapt and change and make innovative decision, rapid decision, courageous courageous decision and knowing that there can be mistake or we just live in our old way and, oh well i mean what can we do there are two kinds of mindset and i always believe seeing opportunity in in crisis and learning from crisis to effect change because this is something very important in this moment this is the moment when organization leaders and managers should recognize who did what and how and then identify who struggled, who failed, who, who succeeded, who shined. So because in next time when that kind of a emergency happen or crisis takes place in an organization, you're prepared. Who are your top performer? Who, who can be who can be better ready prepared? So it is an opportunity to learn, not in terms of people, but you know, to develop resources and capabilities of an organization. So having said that, it was just a context. What do we do in our program uh, to help a student to, to be battle ready for a crisis like this or any other kind of crisis? So the certificate in advanced management for information professional, it is a 15 credit online uh, program and it requires five courses like um, management of information organization, course in project management, marketing and advocacy, uh, knowledge management course, and, and finally the last course is the capstone course. So what do we do in our courses? First of all, we, we cultivate a critical thinking mindset. When it comes to critical thinking, because it is important in any given situation like uh, an ongoing crisis, we need to make a lot of rapid decision, quick decision, analyze uh, current situation, ongoing situation, which change day by day, and it's not going to uh, uh, it's not going to work well if if our graduates or or anybody in leadership or management position they don't have decision making. A capability to uh, to to handle complex situations. So what happens? We provide in each management course a lot of a different kind of case studies in every management course, and those case studies are pretty complex, and uh, and, and 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 presents a lot of uh, work related situation. And there is, I mean, when we are providing those case scenarios to students, we always tell them, you may face a similar situation or you may entirely face a new situation because no solution is a perfect uh, solution. And by just analyzing, studying all those case scenarios, you can be better prepared because if we think management is just a common sense, then I mean, that's how it, it, uh, it creates more accidental managers rather than intentional managers. So, it, so I consider management is an extension of common sense. There's a lot of common sense, but education helps you to make a, a conscious and better decision. So those case studies are of in, in different areas, leadership, human re, uh, resources, conflict, ethical decision making, gossip, intimidation, marketing, project management, change management, just to name a few. And how do we cultivate now? Let's talk about this crisis mindset in our program. So we, I mean, I already talked briefly about SWOT analysis, like strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. In each management courses that are listed here, like you see management of information organization, LIS 240, 
to six tree marketing and advocacy knowledge management or project management in each course like in 240 students are asked to prepare a strategic plan so i mean given this situation like in many organizations it happens strategic plan is an annual exercise you prepare a strategic plan and you just put it on your bookshelf is i mean or it is it, it has and in every of those plans like in marketing course they prepare marketing plan in knowledge management course they prepare knowledge action plan in project management students prepare project charter in each of those plans in learning activity the students ask to prepare ask to provide two to three contingency indicators triggers responses that can create some kind of crisis more often than not the students uh, indicate about people's problem uh, people's buy-in and budget problem so they i mean if they have already taken this course they know they have gone through it if they have not gone through it they know this is what they will be doing so they have to come up with those two three indicators and then they have to provide responses and students have all this opportunity to create their plans in the context of an organization they are working for or they can base their plan based on the organization they are working for or the type of organization they would like to work for. in in advocacy campaign proposal they have to come up with a communication plan just to sway people's opinion so in resource management including budgets so all those different kind of activities provides a student that kind of mindset, I would say, because it happens. Sometimes the students reach out to me. Well, I want to take a knowledge management course. Uh, is it going to provide, uh, it, will it be about archives or public library or academic library? I always, or about museum, I always tell, I mean, the same courses are designed in a way that provides them a solid foundation, a base that they can handle uh, or, or to design to provide a mindset so that they can prepare their plan in the context of any organization they work for rather than for on focusing on a particular organization. Talking about knowledge management, it's not about software. We can buy software and train students but tomorrow there will be new software. If they have a mindset to adapt, there won't be any problem. But if we just train them only in one particular aspect, so what's going to happen? Like for me, I started my journey as an educator, uh, it started with Blackboard, then I learned Canvas, another learning management system, and then I started working with updated Blackboard version. I worked with Adobe Connect, now I'm working with WebEx, so it's, I mean, nobody can train somebody in any in every aspect of life. I mean, life as a graduate program cannot provide every kind of a skill set that everyone is looking for, but it can provide a solid base, a foundation, a mindset to respond to those challenges. And through with the help of group and individual work, case studies. Uh, I I know students hate group work, but they are all management <laughs> courses. And in real life, believe me, people work with people. Whether you like it or hate it, it is the similar kind of situation you will experience in real life too. Sometimes group work will work, you would love it, and sometimes you would hate it because it doesn't work. So, but what it does, I mean, at least through teamwork, you learn to negotiate ideas, you know, to influence each other's ideas, get by, help to motivate, help learn how to delegate. And of course, the way assignments are set up, this project, there is a lot of ground for creativity. I mean, you can create your plan in the context of any organization you work for, your communication, you're con communicating back and forth with your Resilience. I mean, this is something, as I said, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. If it doesn't work, just think about good thing, like it develops tolerance, resilience. I mean, maybe you end up doing more, but it is going to help you more. But that's what it is. I mean, how this program helps prepare a crisis management mindset. So at this point, it's just a kind of a 
wrap up like you know if when people say before i switch it over to shilpa so being unprepared is no excuse like you know a crisis happens challenges people encounter challenges and you can fall down but not to get up if you're not getting up this is not an excuse and know the threat and be ready for that and make rapid quick and maybe imperfect decision but in crisis people need to make quick decision and if you need help i mean there isn't there isn't any problem we should go out and seek help from outside and communication is the key i mean if uh, I, I i'm not teaching many face to face courses right now but i i mean this is my favorite quote you know the biggest illusion of communication is that it has taken place so i mean i cannot it is so important whether it is group work or in the context of organization or anywhere there's no communication there's no coordination and it is it can be very challenging to accomplish uh, if, uh, anybody's goal and everybody can be part of a solution rather than becoming a part of problem during a crisis there can't be any frustrating thing when people i mean if there is an attitude of uh, oh not my job that kind of mentality and and always remember like i said there is an opportunity in every crisis during this crisis I, i have been able to connect with my colleagues you know from finland every weekly basis that we have not been doing this is a new thing and we are talk about our research on weekly basis so people have their unique situation and many people try to find out opportunities in crisis and it just depends on people's mindset so i will switch it over to shilpa who will share her experiences and her perspective with our program what she learned and what i mean what she uses in the context of um, her workplace i mean of all those things she learned from us and um, thereafter we can talk about uh, you and a Hi. Uh, I hope everyone is doing well. I actually just wanted to briefly talk about how the program helped me uh develop some management and leadership skills. So the assignments and the case studies and the projects that we did during the course work I would say were definitely useful because the projects that we did actually gave an idea of what to expect if you are in a leadership role then how can you create plans how can you come up with the contingency plans and that i think was really useful because that was related to the real world uh the case studies definitely were uh, were were a major plus point in the program because those case studies were real world situations So if you are uh, caught in a real world situation uh, in the real world how do you react to it how do you take upon the leadership a leadership role and solve certain issues that are related to say human resources or that are even if you have to approach to your upper management how do you approach those some of the skills that i actually develop during those course where um critical thinking um and decision making uh, and also it leveraged my ability in developing strategies and developing processes for certain projects that i would be handling so definitely each and every course that i took in the program helped me in some way or the other not necessarily you work in the in the areas but having an idea or having a knowledge of the area uh that is not associated with you helps you better your work so those are where some of the key i would say points that i took out of the program uh in this current situation that we are in i don't think uh any program or any knowledge that you have gained would really help you uh, it's your experience uh definitely and 
of course, some of the knowledge that you learn through these programs is definitely going to create a mindset for you, which will help you communicate maybe better or maybe relay some of the information to your colleagues better than what you used to do before. So at St. John's University Library, some of the management skills that I was able to utilize and actually saw being utilized were rapid decision making, defining priorities, then building uh, one of the things that we did at the libraries was build a response team, which took uh, charge of the situation uh, and creating a culture of accountability because our focus actually we had to shift our focus uh, from face to face to online so that was very critical for us to understand what the requirement of the user body is going to be so that that was something that uh, we literally had to learn as we progressed uh, the basic thing that the management had to look into was not only providing the services, but also ensuring that the well-being of the employees who were who work in the libraries. So these were some of the key points or the management skills that I saw being utilized at St. John's. One of the things that I would like to mention about the courses that are being offered through the program is one course in particular actually is the knowledge management course. I think that course is very critical in this uh, in the present situation. Uh, I think we all uh, have experienced that we had to change our our uh, processes or the workflows that we had created for ourselves. And I think documenting those workflows or documenting those processes is really critical and creating a knowledge bank would really be helpful. Uh, that is something that I learned through the knowledge management course, how to create a knowledge bank. And the knowledge bank would definitely will be useful if, God forbid, we should not be going through this crisis again. But if for some matter, if another crisis comes uh, if we have to face another crisis, then I think the knowledge bank can definitely help us to look back to see if those processes or those workflows were, were created, which we can use and not reinvent the, uh, the entire thing. And also, I think if we can capture the experiences, that would definitely be useful because based on those experiences, we can build upon on if we have to face a crisis, we can build upon and act upon the situation that we are facing. So basically, that's my intake. I'm going to pass it over to uh, Dr. Singh for his comments. Oh, no, that's wonderful. <laughs> I, Shilpa, um, uh, I, I will let Michael talk about, since you just uh, wrapped up your presentation with the knowledge management, I would like to say I do not know probably my colleagues, Michael and my uh, department chair, Dr. Warbach, already know that the knowledge management course, it, it was full, the moment registration was open. So we don't know exactly what happened. If students are thinking along the same lines that you just suggested, we just don't know, but um, it was a kind of uh, fascinating. <laughs> so that's my comment. I will let Michael do handle the rest of the webinar. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Uh, so Professor Karnick, uh, for taking the time to join us today and, and describe the work uh, done in the Certificate for, for Information Professionals. Uh, I just had a question. I, uh, I'm a logistics person. Uh, we can't hear you. Uh, manufactory in Rome, Italy, and I did that for two years. And I mean, talk about smoldering crises, right? This was uh, about almost 20 years ago. And at the time, uh, you know, European labor unions are a breed apart from anything we have here in North America. And one of the smoldering crises was uh, dealing with solidarity strikes. So I remember one day in Rome, the first solidarity strike I encountered was the transit workers in Rome 
uh, went on a labor strike and they shut down all transit for one hour on, I believe, Wednesday afternoon just to draw attention to it. However, the supermarket workers were also unionized and the postal carriers were also unionized and the street sweepers and sanitation workers were also unionized. And so effectively, every laborer in Rome stepped out on the street for an hour that Wednesday and everything ground to a halt. And I, coming from New York and, and coming from a labor family, I was sympathetic to their plight, but I did have to come up with a series of contingencies for the factory in that our production was disrupted because it just so happened that that was the afternoon that a few of our seamstresses had gone to another warehouse to pick up some materials. And so getting the material back, it just disrupted our supply line. And when you work in couture, every hour that a seamstress doesn't have a needle and thread in her hand is an hour of production time lost. And so we were on the verge of missing deadlines and delivery dates. So in this crisis now, I've, I've matured and I've been able to step back and see uh, a lot more moving parts. And this webinar series has helped me uh, in that I'm getting to talk to other professionals in various uh, siloed practices. We talked to academic librarians, we've talked to archivists and records managers. Uh, I find that managing people and managing the expectations of the labor force or your working group is hard. Uh, initially, classified people as either do nothing or do good, right? The do-gooders are people uh, that are motivated to continue producing. They want to help. They want to, they, the, the, the kinds of people that run toward the fire, right? But then as the weeks have gone on, I found uh, a third and I think more dangerous class of person because the do-nothings, you can, you know where they are in the world. You know who they are and, and you, you can just leave them be. They'll be fine. They don't want to do any more. Uh, you just have to make sure that they're not doing any less. The do gooders are out trying to do the best and they're being very creative. They're producing uh, webinar series like this. They're producing videos for their patrons and public libraries. They're producing online exhibits for their historical societies and archives. But then you have the do everythings. And these are the people that start more fires than they're capable of putting out because they want to do everything. They want to step up and overmanage. So what would you recommend as a way to identify and even manage people's expectations during a, a kind of cri during a crisis, not like this one, but not a medical crisis like this one necessarily, but any kind of crisis? How do we manage our staff? Okay, so I'm going to have my two cents and then I will let Shilpa talk about it. So I mean, uh, I mean, in, in, so here's my response in any kind of organization. There always and it is a number. There are 25% people. I mean, that's a minority 25% people. They can be naysayer or they can be they can be those people who believe in your cause. So those 25% people who believe in your cause, they are the most important people. And in fact, it is a pretty interesting research done by researchers from Netherlands and some researchers at the University of Pennsylvania after the last presidential election, what happened? So I'm not going to talk about politics. I'm just talking about our research. And that research, those researchers found it is just 25% magical number in the context of any organization that make changes happen in any direction. If those 20, if we can motivate those 25% people, if we can buy in from those 25% people, they can neutralize the other. I mean, again, that same minority that can be 24%, 20%, but it is the 25% critical number. If those naysayers, they become 25%, they take over, nothing happens in organization. If those, that 25% is the tipping point and rest of people in between, they are, they people, those people, they go along with the majority. Whoever takes over, whether it is naysayers or those who are your top performer of your organization. So I would say, those, identify those, those, those highly dedicated, driven, motivated people, and they can sway the opinion. And that's what research and those researchers, they did research about simple, simple things like here, here, 
Here are their four names like Michael, Jim, or Kevin. So who is the better name? And all of a sudden, some people say no, Michael is a better name. Somebody says no, just Kevin. And then if, if the moment that tipping point, like if 25% goes over there, Everybody says, yeah, Michael is a better name. Fine. So this is how it's happening in the, and this is based on the research that uh, Kyle, my student who works with me, Kyle and I presented at the universe, a Catholic University of America in February. So I would say like, just to identify, and in this given crisis situation, identify uh, kind of your few priorities. In this environment, we can't do everything. The most important thing and to have those a uh, buy-in from those people i mean you can't do anything about those naysayers in that in this crisis in critical situation so far you want to add anything <laughs> No, I, I'm just going to talk in relation to what this uh, what the St. John's University Libraries did. So basically the there was a response team that uh, that was created in the libraries under the guidance of the associate dean. And basically the, uh, a few key people were identified who uh, who um, you could say that they they were kind of who could take the responsibility and who could who could be held accountable for certain areas and uh, the team was built and that's how we proceeded especially in this uh, situation and uh, that's what we are doing currently so i i hope that helps well, while you're on the subject of St. John's, can you, of the university in the chat, can you comment further on the changing workflows related to the COVID-19 crisis? So, uh, one of the big things that uh, the challenge that we faced was there was no longer face-to-face -face instruction, or there was no longer face-to-face -face service. So, uh, basically, that. I think, Michael, I kind of lost you. Oh, no, you're back. OK, uh, so what I was saying is that some of the things that changed literally overnight was we didn't have any face to face services. So there was no lo longer like we were not doing face to face instruction. Or they were not face to face inst uh, services like circulation or reference. So those things had to be looked at and that had to be changed to accommodate uh, the current situation. So uh, that was that was what we did. So uh, adding, uh, you could say, literally like adding some campus guide pages, which would, which uh, gave information on how you could uh, get those services. We no longer had access to our print material. So if the print material is not, uh, if you cannot access the print material, how can you get hold of those resources? Those were some kind of some things that had to be changed. So the process, the way it was done had to be changed. Uh, and that's what I um, I would say. Okay. What do you think Can you say something oh. in the context of another library, Michael, here, like where I'm living currently in Stanford? So after this crisis has started, like I'm giving you example as in I go to the public library a couple of times in a week. I used to go, not anymore. So after this crisis started and everything was shut down. So literally I saw that library was, I, I was thinking all those programs they were totally collapsed like library was just le letting us know that okay if you want ebooks we have ebooks if you want a library card we have lab you can still get library card and and we have extended the due dates basically i was thinking really that's what's going to happen like for the rest i mean during this crisis but i have to say i was impressed two weeks later i mean there were many in face-to-face like community program, their meditation session, their 
MS office training and community conversation about civility in America, racial issue, etc. And gradually, two weeks later, this library started doing all offering those program in partnership with community via Zoom. So that was impressive. It was not a problem that it started. So this is how you adapt to workflow. Like I mean, there was a situation. It was a unique situation for all of us. For some of us, oh, what do we do? We can't do anything. We don't have this and that kind of thing. But there are people who try to find solution of the problem and adjust and adapt to changing circumstances. Theme that's come up in all of these talks that we've had in response to this crisis, uh, you know, the idea that your contingency plan, uh, you may have an idea of what you're looking for if you're doing a SWOT analysis. Uh, I don't know how often that happens uh, in this field. I don't know if you're, when you issue your annual report to your stakeholders or to your taxpayer base uh, as a nonprofit, do you conduct that kind of assessment and include that documentation? And then that begs the question of going forward, uh, if you're changing your workflows, if you change your programming priorities to provide more remote access uh, to replace in-person service, where is the nexus? Where do you do you scale back your online? Do you scale back your in-person once everyone is back in the building? I mean, I've only heard one director say that she intends for this to be the m mode of delivery for programming go into the future because during this period, as you said, Dr. Singh, her public library uh, made adjustments and they started offering more electronic service points, including a digital library card. Uh, and so now they're attracting more users who are attracted to the online services, the digital services, and not the physical services or in-person services. So how will she manage that new population? She has to continue giving them this level of digital service. So it's a big challenge, and I think that this is an evolving process. And I just hope that uh, what we learn from this, uh, a lot of us will take forward into our practice and at the institutions will maintain this level of service going forward because there have been a lot of remarkable changes made to service models throughout librarianship across the country. So I think it's it's a very exciting time. One of our speakers said that, you know, this, this event changes the face of everything. So in higher ed, it's changing the face of the way we deliver content and in primary and secondary ed as well. It's changing the face of healthcare and, and the uh, sudden uh, use of telehealth services for counseling for patient and outpatient care. Uh, it's changing uh, our expectations of the economy and the role and definition of essential workers. So there's so much of society that's changing now uh, that I think having these tools, the toolkit that comes from the Certificate of Management and Information Professions uh, is definitely of value. If there are questions, please feel free to drop them into the chat. If you scroll down to your screen on the bottom, that seven button menu opens up. The chat function is the cartoon speech bubble, third from the right. And as we wind down, I just want to take a moment to thank both of our speakers today, uh, Dr. Singh, You'll be teaching that highly uh, in-demand knowledge management course this summer. Uh, so hopefully uh, we'll hear from more students interested in that. And also you'll be teaching uh, what is now listed as 275. It's a relatively new course for DLIS, this offering. And that is uh, cultural competence for, in for information professionals. Do you want to talk to us briefly about what that course will entail? I mean, in, in the culture, uh, in this cultural competence for information professional, I mean, it is a pretty exciting course. And here, I mean, why, I mean, how did we come up with this course? First of all, most of library schools offer a course about uh, library programs and services to diverse population and many programs that course exists, but this course is different in that aspect because it's not only focusing on collection and services rather than it focusing on a competency development. So here we are talking about some kind of uncomfortable issues because like talking about uh, like diversity, somehow it has become a kind of overloaded word. It looks like a kind of checkbox in the context of every organization you give a training and check the box that we're done with it. So people have, somehow 
develop some sort of diversity fatigue or losing interest in that thing. So we came up with this idea. So we talk about some uncomfortable issues like race privileges. First of all, privileges like how to talk about the, an intersectionality. We talk about cultural intelligence. I mean, in cultural competence, shift focus from race to competence, like your attitude, your knowledge, uh, and behavior, how you develop those kinds of things, and what are expectations in customer service, and what are uh, 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 cultural competence or cultural um, intelligence expectations for I mean, uh, how they will students may need it in in their leadership roles because. The workforce is becoming global by nature all the time and whether people like it or not, if they're working in an area like New York or LA, so they will be working with different ethnicities and people need to figure out their way how to work together with different people and and have to understand their own blind spots, their biases. And if we are aware about own blind spot and biases, so we will be able to deal with people more effectively because I mean first of all we seldom uh, introspect ourselves I mean last semester when we offered it the first time I gave an assignment to a student about um, cultural identity exploration and I mean I didn't know how it is going to work but students rose to the occasion and they wrote such great papers about this thing like you know to navigating their own cultural identity and when I read those papers I just thought it's all about cultural humility it's an another area for research so all those things are not being uh, kind of I mean they're emerging in our profession ACRL has established a task force just a few months after we started uh, this course. So we were just ahead of the game and it is a pretty good course. It's just basically this, this is how I can summarize and there are other interesting learning activities I'm, I can talk on and on. Well, there's another question, of course. When you talk about cultural competencies, are you including the culture of the organization? Yes, I am using because about about the I mean we are using there's a Dutch researcher whose work I'm using. In fact, I take a test about I mean people can take those kinds of tests and that gives me five different kind of indicators like my ability to work with people. So basically like it's not measuring in any organization but to be aware about your collaborative skills about how you're making decision in the bigger scheme of uh, this cultural competence that can help an organization to assess its cultural competency so yes in the end this cultural competence uh, this is where we address this issue as well excellent uh that's really uh I think relevant in it, as you said, you're kind of leading the discussion uh, and our program is one of the first to have a course like this. Uh, any other questions, feel free to drop them into the chat. All right, and uh, finally, Dr. Singh, there's a new project that you're involved in, some new research on uh, the emotional, or sorry, no, the information and emotion in response to COVID-19. It's a survey that you're conducting. Everyone in the room today will get a link to complete the survey and we encourage you to share it as broadly as possible so that Dr. Singh may get a wide audience of participants. Uh, anyone in the United States over the age of 18, is that correct, Dr. Singh? Yes, that's a kind of, a, uh, th that's 100% correct and uh, this project is about like understanding people's uh, emotions during this crisis because we are handling with a lot of information in this situation some people are handling well some people are angry some people are stressed some people are anxious some people are very very upset so how we are handling that kind of situation when there's too much information how do we check the reliability of information i mean do we have too little information do we have too much information find out how people are handling and managing information in this crisis and how we can identify some strategies for managing our emotions in crisis if it happens in the future because we just don't have any idea uh, uh, like how 
how people are managing. You know, some people are managing well and some people are like, for example, I can tell in my course that there were a couple of students when they started lack the communication they couldn't submit their assignment in a timely manner i reached out to them i talked with both of them and a few days ago i heard from submit everything who, who thanked me about okay this flexibility of submitting assignments later it, it was a lifesaver i did the circumstances to have flexibility to submit assignment later without any penalty the other student at the same time who tried but couldn't, but still one student will be able to do so. It was worth of my time. So you can see even in those two cases, like how two students are handling information, same information in a different context, one people in a different geographical region and their person in different geographical region. Well, for more information on our Certificate of Management for Information Professionals, you can visit the St. John's uh, DLIS website at stjohns.edu slash DLIS. Or if you want to reach out to us with any questions or follow-up information, inquiries about our programs of study, please email DLIS at stjohns.edu. Thank you again, Dr. Singh. Thank you, Professor Karnick, for talking to us today. I'm going to wrap up the meeting uh, in just a few seconds with uh, some information about the rest of this Let's Talk series. Uh, this Thursday, I will be joined by a very special guest. Uh, and we'll be talking about coping and uh, that's this Thursday, April 16th at 3.30, same uh, bat room, same bat channel, same bat time, right? Uh, then we're following up next week with providing remote services to older adults. We'll have some friends from Book Brooklyn Library uh, Committee on Old or Department of Older Adult Reference Services or Older Adult Services. Then next Thursday, we're going to hear from uh, our friends, uh, in special ed, and we'll be discussing library services in support of special education, K through 12, uh, primarily providing technological assistance or technological devices and uh, remote reference services to children with special needs. And then we'll be hearing from some other remote reference librarians scattered around the country. Finally, the series concludes on April 30th with our DLIS Directors Forum. And just if you're a student in DLIS, just know that registration is currently open at so is advisement. And the DLIS ePortfolio for May 2020 degree conferral is due next Wednesday, April 22nd. So thanks again, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you. And you'll get a feedback evaluation form and a link to complete uh, Dr. Singh's survey in your email box sometime in the next uh, few hours. So take Thank care. You, I really safe. appreciate it. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye bye, everyone. Be well. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singh.